Chapter 17, Section 4 of J. B. Bury's The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 1, by John Bagnell Bury. Chapter 17, The Principate of Nero, 54 to 68 A.D. Section 4. The Conspiracy of Piso. Tigellinus was unwearied in sending out pretenders to the Principate. By this policy he helped to fill the imperial coffers and to render himself indispensable. In 64 A.D., D. Junius Torquatus Silanus was accused of treason and driven to suicide. But a profound and widely spread discontent prevailed among the nobles, and a conspiracy was formed which came to a head in the spring of 65 A.D. C. Calpurnius Piso, whom the conspirators chose to fill the place of Nero, was one of the most prominent and popular men in Rome at this time. He lived in magnificent style, was lavish of his wealth, and was ready to place his powers of oratory at the service of the poor. He had winning manners, and his life was as dissolute as that of Nero or Tigellinus. He lazily consented to be the center of a plot, the dangers of which he was not sufficiently ambitious to share. What seemed to give this enterprise a considerable chance of success was the adherence of Phanius Rufus, the Praetorian prefect, who was jealous and afraid of his powerful colleague, Tigellinus. Along with Rufus, a number of the tribunes and officers, who had been passed over by Tigellinus, joined the conspiracy. Conspicuous among these was the tribune Subrius Flavius. Among the rest were the council designate Plautius Laterinus, Antonius Natalis, a friend of Piso, Aeneas Lucanus, the poet, whose verses had incurred the disfavor of the emperor, Claudius Senecio, a courtier constantly in attendance on Nero, and so able to keep his associates aware of what was going on in the palace. Lucan's mother and a freedwoman named Epicarus were also initiated into the project. Epicarus tried to win over an officer of the fleet, Volusius Proculus, who was supposed to have a grudge against Nero, but he deceived her expectation by revealing the affair to the emperor. As, however, she had mentioned no names, the conspirators were not discovered. They then decided to kill Nero during the Feast of Ceres, between the 12th and 19th of April, at the games in the circus. The plan was the same as that which had been successfully adopted by the assassins of Julius Caesar. Lateranus was to present a petition to Nero, and clinging to his legs throw him on the ground. The rest were to bury their weapons in his body. But Flavius Scavinus, who claimed the first blow, foolishly betrayed the secret, which had hitherto been closely preserved. He made his will, gave the dagger, which he had chosen for the deed, to his freedman Milicus to sharpen, got ready the appliances for binding up wounds, and gave his slaves and freedmen a luxurious feast. These unusual proceedings excited the suspicions of Milicus, who at daybreak sought and obtained an audience with Nero. Scavenus was arrested, but his examination led to nothing, and the plot would not have been discovered if Milicus had not remembered the frequent visits which his master received from Natalus. When Natalus was examined separately, his evidence did not agree with that of Scavenus, and in this way the accusation of the freedmen was proved to be well founded. Threats of torture and promises of mercy induced the two conspirators to vie with each other in revealing the names of their associates. Their conduct contrasted with the constancy of Epicarus, who submitted to tortures and in the end strangled herself rather than betray her trust. The names of the military conspirators had not been disclosed, and Phanius Rufus took his seat beside Tigellinus at the trial and sought to divert suspicion from himself by his zeal as a judge. But when one of the accused denounced him, he turned pale and could not defend himself. The proceedings against the victims were summary, but they were allowed to choose their own mode of death. Piso, who had shown irresolution and cowardice through the whole episode, and Lateranus were slain without resistance, and Piso made a cringing will in favor of the emperor. Among the first whose names were betrayed, and who were condemned to die, was the philosopher Seneca. It is not improbable that he was really implicated in the enterprise, and in any case it seems to have been the wish of the military associates in the plot to elevate him instead of Piso to the supreme power. If Nero had any wish to spare his former tutor, 
he was hindered by Popeia and Tigellinus. Seneca had just returned from Campania with his wife Paulina, and was staying at a country house four miles from the city. When the message of death was brought, his wife declared her resolution of dying along with him, and they severed the veins of their arms. The flow of blood in Seneca's old frame was languid, and his agony was protracted. As he lay slowly bleeding, he dictated a composition which was afterwards published. To hasten his end he swallowed poison, which, however, had no effect on his drained body, and death was finally brought about by the steam of a hot bath. But Paulina was not permitted to die. Nero had no cause of hatred against her, and her arms were bound up by the orders of the soldiers. She lived some years longer, faithful to her husband's memory, and the lasting pallor of her skin was a monument of her attempt to die with him. The fate of this distinguished philosopher, and that of his nephew, the poet Lucan, gave this abortive conspiracy a certain celebrity. Lucan opened his veins in the bath, and, as he felt the animation depart from his feet and hands, recited appropriate verses of his own, describing a wounded soldier bleeding to death. Subrius Flavus, a tribune of one of the Praetorian cohorts, distinguished himself by his bold words to Nero. When the tyrant asked him why he conspired, he replied, quote, Because I hated you. None of the soldiers was more loyal, as long as you deserved our affection. I began to hate you when you became an assassin of your mother and your wife, a charioteer, an actor, and an incendiary. End quote. The council Vestinus was included among the victims, although his guilt was not clear, and it is said that Nero wanted to get rid of him on account of his wife Statlia Messalina. Nero married Messalina in the following year. Natalis was pardoned, Milicus was richly rewarded, and received the name of preserver. The Praetorian guards received each man two thousand sesterces, and were for the future provided with bread free of cost. Triumphal decorations were granted to the prefect Tigellinus, Cocaeus Nerva, and Petronius Terpilianus, who had helped in the judicial proceedings, and their statues were set up in the Palladium. Consular insignia were conferred on Nymphidius Sabinus, who had succeeded Phanius Rufus as Praetorian prefect. A temple was erected to Salus, the dagger of Scavius was dedicated to Jupiter the Avenger, and the month of April was named Neronianus. It was even proposed, but the proposal was rejected, to erect a temple to Nero. It is noteworthy that a full account of the judicial proceedings, which were conducted by the imperial concilium, was published. Both later in 65 AD and in the succeeding year, executions took place which seem to have been in some way connected with the conspiracy of Piso. Aeneas Mella, brother of Seneca and father of Lucan, was condemned on the ground of a forged letter of his son, charging him with complication in Piso's plot. About the same time perished T. Petronius, on the charge of a suspicious friendship with the conspirator Scavenus, but really on account of the jealousy of Tigellinus. Petronius was a man who made the pleasures of vice a fine art, and his judgment was regarded as the standard of taste in all matters of luxury at Rome. He was the glass of fashion. His feasts were elegant, his debauchery refined. He was named arbiter as the arbitrator or director of the emperor's pleasures, and Tigellinus, who aspired to be Nero's sole guide in such things, envied the influence of Petronius. When the emperor was in Campania, 66 A.D., Tigellinus caused Petronius to be detained at Cumae. Seeing that his fate was determined, the voluptuary was true to the principles of his life in the moments of his death. Having opened his veins, he bade the physician bind them up again, and repeating this operation at intervals, he spent his last hours at a banquet, amusing his friends with wanton verses. He also composed an account of the unnatural orgies of the emperor, and sent it to him under seal. This led to the banishment of a woman named Cilia, whom Nero suspected of having betrayed the scenes in the palace in which she had taken part. Having butchered so many illustrious men, Nero at length desired to destroy virtue herself by the death of Thracia Paetus and Perea Serranus, end quote. P. Clodius Thracia Paetus was more remarkable for what he was than for anything he did. He was the leader of the party of opposition which yearned, helplessly, for the restoration of the Republic, and set up the younger Cato as their ideal. He was the embodiment of their virtues and their faults. 
born at Patavium, he was simple in his habits, incorruptible in his morals, and out of sympathy with the luxury of Rome. He married Aria, the daughter of a man who had fallen in a conspiracy against Claudius, and whose wife had heroically slain herself. He and his son-in-law, Helvidius Priscus, used to crown themselves with garlands and celebrate the birthdays of Brutus and Cassius. Thracia distinguished himself in the Senate by his rough independence. He withdrew without voting, when the motion was made to condemn the memory of Agrippina. He declined to take any part in the Neronian games. He did not attend the funeral of Poppaea. When one Antistius was condemned to death for mocking the emperor in verse, Thracia endeavored to moderate the flattery of the Senate. It was said that he never sacrificed for the emperor's safety. He and his party were always protesting against the government in insignificant matters, and asserting their independence in trifles. Their republican idea was an anachronism, their rhetoric was hollow. Their activity was chiefly confined to society and literature. Thracia was a Stoic, and he composed a life of his model, Cato. Lucan's Pharsalia was a characteristic work of this party of opposition, which, throughout the whole period of the Julian and Claudian dynasties, fostered its utopias and repeated its shallow phrases. It must be owned that they had the courage of their opinions, and that their bitterness against the Principate was natural enough, for its institution had destroyed the political power of the senatorial order. Nor could they see, as clearly as we can see now, that even imperial despotism was a lesser evil for the Roman world than the government of the Senate in the last days of the Republic. The courageous obstinacy of Thracia led to his destruction. All his little sins of omission and commission against the majesty of the emperor were marshalled by Capito Cosutianus, a son-in-law of Tigellinus, and another delator, Eprius Marcellus. And at the same time Berea Soranus was accused on various charges, among others that he had been intimate with rebellious Plautus. The chief witness against him was P. Ignatius Seller, a Stoic philosopher. The daughter of Soranus, Servilia, was also charged with treasonable divination concerning Nero. The cases were tried by the Senate, and all three were condemned. Helvidius Priscus, who was likewise accused of neglecting his duties as senator, was banished. Thracia adopted the usual mode of death among condemned nobles and opened his veins, forbidding his wife Aria to follow her mother's example. As the first blood spouted, he said, A libation to Jove the Deliverer. In the meantime Nero had been busy with those pursuits for which he imagined he had a special calling. He had appeared publicly on the stage at Neapolis, 64 A.D., where, from the Greek character of the city, he expected a favorable reception, and he received such enthusiastic applause that he determined to exhibit his skill to Greece herself. He had made preparations for a visit to that country, but the project was not carried out until two years later. In the meantime he celebrated the Neronia a second time, 65 A.D., read his poems to a delighted audience, and appeared as a Cytherotus. It was considered almost high treason not to appear in the theatre on such occasions. Towards the close of the following year, 66, Nero visited Greece, where he appeared at all the public spectacles, and danced and sang without any reserve. Those towns in which musical contests were held had sent invitations to him, offering him prizes, and the four great games at Olympia, Delphi, Isthmus, and Nemea, which were regularly celebrated in successive years, were crowded into the space of one year for his sake, so he could win the glory of being a periodo nikos, or victor at all four. Besides this irregularity, a musical contest was held at Olympia, contrary to want. He also competed in a chariot race, and is said to have received the prize, though his horses and chariot fell. The proclamation was made in this form, quote, Nero the emperor is victorious, and crowns the people of the Romans and the world which is his. End quote. Nero was attended on his Greek tour by a large train of courtiers and praetorian guards, and he seems to have indulged in debauchery with less reserve than ever. He had a profound admiration for Greece and the Greek people, and he could not brook that they should hold the position of mere provincials. He determined to reward them for their kindness to himself and their appreciation of his artistic talents. So he enacted at Corinth the scene which, two and a half centuries before, had been enacted by Flaminius. He proclaimed in the marketplace the freedom of the Greeks. The province of Achaia was done away with. 
the proclamation of Nero was very different in practical effect from that of Flaminius. It was harmless, it did not mean civil war, it merely relieved a favored portion of the empire from the burden of taxation. Nero's Greek visit was also marked by a serious attempt to cut through the Isthmus of Corinth, a project which had been most recently entertained by his uncle Gaius. Nero inaugurated the beginning of the work himself, but after his departure it was abandoned. Nero's visit to Greece was marked by the destruction of three consular legates, of whose power or ambition the emperor was jealous or afraid. The most important of these was Corbulo, whom we have already met in the Rhine, and whose exploits in the East will be recorded in the following chapter. The other two were Scrobinius Rufus and Scrobinius Proculus, brothers, who at this time were the legati of the two Germanies. It is unknown what accusations were preferred against them, or who were their enemies. While the emperor was absent, he left a freedman named Helius as his representative in Rome, and he could probably have found no one more faithfully devoted to his interests. At the beginning of the year 68 AD, serious signs of discontent were apparent in the provinces, and plots in the western armies against the emperor were suspected. Helius crossed over to Greece and urged Nero to return if he would save his power. He entered Rome, born in the chariot in which Augustus had triumphed, crowned with the Olympian wreath. He was hailed as Nero Apollo and Nero Hercules, and coins were struck on which he was depicted as a flute player. But although he was flattered on all sides, he soon left Rome for Campania, where he breathed more freely. End of chapter 17, section 4